Welcome to the Home and Family Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Jody Chafee, and I'm so excited today to have Sheila Welsh and Maria Farner on the podcast today. Sheila and Maria are two educators from Santa Cruz, California. They believe that childhood is special and needs to be treated as so. They explore topics on their Moms I Know podcast that celebrate childhood and motherhood in all its seasons. Welcome, Sheila and Maria. So happy to have you. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. Hey, so I'm so excited to have you guys on and, and I'm excited to interview another, other podcasters. It's always a delight to, to know, you know, talk to other seasoned podcasters and, and uh, you know, talking about you know, why, what made you want to start your podcast? Like when I think about what I started my podcast, I'm so excited and get passionate about it. And, and so I'd love to hear your background. Like what made you guys think to start this Moms I Know podcast? Okay, great question. Start with uh, Mar- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Maria, Maria was my children's homeschool teacher. So as that position, every month we would go in and we would talk about my children's learning. We would talk about children. We would talk about homeschooling, both being educators and both being, um, you know, really kind of intentional with our children's education as well as our parenting styles. We we bonded over that. So we had. 10 years of conversations that just always inspired both of us um, to, to, to do better. And so we both kind of went off on our own with, um, you know, I don't want to say uh, opportunities to help families, to help parents. Yeah. And we, we just came together and we're like, let's continue our conversation. My children are no longer homeschooling, but I would love to keep going with this conversation. And that's how really the Moms I Know podcast was, was born, which is really being intentional and inspiring parents that, you know, it's, we have to pay attention if we want to um, help this next generation. I love that. I love this. I, I love that you guys are will, like having these conversations. They're probably super natural and really exciting. Got, I can just picture you guys getting like really excited or like really worked up about topics or things like that. And just being like, we need to, we need to get this information out there. We need to help other people. And to see this information is so important, especially this idea of intentionality and, and raising our children to, you know, embrace childhood and love childhood. You know, that so many, I feel like, We forget about that. It's so easy to forget. We want to push our kids through and already thinking about colleges when they're in elementary school and things like that. And so it's like, that's, I love that you guys are doing this. So awesome. So what are some of the things that you guys, um, well, let me, let me take a step back. It seems like Maria, you want to say something about that. So (laughs) I'll give you, I'd love to hear your perspective as well. Thanks so much. It's exciting to be here. So yeah, both Sheila and I are so passionate about what we do. And over the years, working with so many different families within um, uh, the homeschool community in Santa Cruz, especially, you know, we we were doing this in the early years. I mean, we really started homeschooling our children back in um, the, gosh, the, the 90s. And so, you know, homeschooling was just kind of on the beginning edges. And so watching the changes in childhood over the last 20, 30 years, for, I think for both of us, it's really strengthened our commitment to make sure that we're reaching out to a lot of families. And so when I left the classroom or the, you know, the homeschool consulting realm, we, I think we both felt this commitment to continue to, to deepen the conversations and to also just reach more people because society has changed so much in the past 20, 30, 40 years. And it's really important to help Uh, parents understand what is really important for children these days and how important developmentally appropriate activities are, how important family culture is. And so we love that you're doing this podcast and that, that, you know, we have ours going. And so we just want to inspire people to think about these choices that they make. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the way that society has changed, the way that childhood has changed. And I think some of us are going, yeah, obviously, but what are some of the things that you've observed that you, that you see, like, what are children missing today that they didn't have in the, in the 80s and 90s when they were growing up? Time, space, um, opportunities to play outside, uh, family time. Uh, you know, it just, I really started noticing a difference even, you know, 30 years ago, everything's speeding yeah. up. And so 
children need time. They need time to just explore and to have creativity and to use their imaginations. And so we've seen a huge change with that. And especially in the last five to 10 years, it's, it's, it's sped up even more and then technology and all of that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's taken away, I think, childhood. And so we, and, and imagination. And so we really look at these foundational things. I read a quote somewhere that said, Child, childhood has changed more in the last 50 years than in the last 50,000. And so wow. we want to return to what is really um, important for children. So what can we do? It, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Sheila. What do you think? What, no, what I was change? just going to say, I see a difference between my 17 year old and my 11 year old. You know, just six and a half years in a difference in how their childhoods are. You know, where my older one was born in 2002, that he, you know, did not grow up with the TV, like just more authentic, more play-based. Whereas the younger one, you know, because she had two older siblings was what rushed along. And that's kind of, I think how it's mm. always gone on the, the younger child, but yet introduce social media, introduce, you know, technology, much more access for my young, my 11 year old than my older kids ever had. And that's because, you know, I didn't get it. I was really late to the cell phone game myself. Do you and think so, that media and screens are the big culprit in, in all of this situation? I do. And I think it's not necessarily that with children. I mean, that is a huge piece, but I think it's more so parents. I think it's more so parents on their social media um, and not paying attention to the children. I mean, we're seeing parents walking, caregivers walking their babies while being connected to their phone rather than their child. We're seeing them role modeling, talking in the car. Their children are seeing that, that that's more important than driving and they're safe. I mean, I mean, we can see it in all, in, you know, all areas. Wow. So we're sending that message to our kids that this device is so important like it's so important yes. that we're it's it's taking all of our attention all of our face value <laughs> face mm -hmm. time right and so sad okay that's really interesting because that, sometimes i think we go oh well our kids don't want to be on these devices or they our kids want to get sucked into social media and talking to their friends well maybe a big part of that is just because that's what they've seen us model for them yeah. well this thing's so important i want to get in on that so that becomes like the norm. That's a big mm -hmm. part of family culture is what's normal. Exactly. And those things that we think are normal, you don't, it's almost like we don't even question those things because it's like, well, that's just the way it always is. Mom's always got her phone in, the, in her hand and her face. So that's normal. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. And I think that, um, you know, that screen time has played a huge factor in children's, you know, lessening attention spans and the brain development. Right. I mean, you know, the brain research is in and we, we're really seeing that. And so I don't think there's a question there. So it's how do we as parents create those boundaries around that and then also look at our own behavior. And Sheila, you know, that, that's so important. But I think that the way that we look at this is, okay, so what do we do instead? And a lot of parents don't have the, you know, like they might've been raised with all of this. And so, you know, like my childhood, we just played outside and we had lots of time and space and we had to come up with things. Whereas now, you know, parents have to actually facilitate the time mm -hmm. and the space for their children because society has changed a lot. And so I think that what Sheila and I are looking at is, you know, these, these sort of pillars or these essentials of family life that really can foster what we're hoping to to have for our children. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Before I go into the pillars, I'm excited about that, but you brought up an interesting point about parents feeling like they have to be facilitators. And I just want to mention that for a second and talk about it because I just think, yes, parents are intended to be the leaders and the nurturers, right? But do parents need to constantly monitor their children's time? What? No, no, she's saying, and that's, shaking her head. <laughs> and that's, no, and that's funny is you know when you look back at at childhood throughout you know millennia, it, you know, children they gravitate to nature, they gravitate to creating things, and so we don't have to be structuring their time. In fact, we're advocates of slowing things down and creating that time and space for them to have to come up with their own ideas. Yeah. It's okay for your children to be bored. It's okay for your children not to have be like, come to you and say, what do I do now? Start, you know, that they need that space. Like you've been talking about to the freedom to just start thinking for themselves and start creating and cultivating their own 
self, right? <laughs> so important. Awesome. Anything you want to add to that, Sheila? Well, it's a practice. You know what I mean? It's, it's a practice in parenting. It's a practice in uh, telling your, your child, you know, it's okay to be bored. It's okay to be alone. It's okay to not know what you're going to do. It's, you know, it's okay. And it reminds me of the book, um, How to Raise an Adult by Julie Lithcott Hames, mm -hmm. of just like really getting out of that place of fear and they will be okay. You know, but I think parenting, whether it's the advent of social media, you know, we're, we're seeing more information, we're getting more fearful, more scared and everything. And if we can take that away from it, we can still, you know, reclaim the childhood, be the guardian of childhood, keep it safe. Don't let our children know what's going on out there just yet. You yeah. know, let Don't them give let them, them that be. device. <laughs> when they're, exactly. When they're keep 10, it off as long eight. as you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Awesome. So I'm excited to talk about these, these pillars of parenthood or pillars of childhood that you'd mentioned. And you, you talked about before I interviewed this family schooling idea that you guys are creating. So I would love to go into that and talk about what that means and how parents can implement that into their families. So what is family schooling? Okay. So we love to talk about this because family schooling is something that Maria and I came about in our discussion. You know, we, we say we have, we have these discussions and we're just talking and family schooling came up and we we're like family schooling oh I love it and we're just like you know it, it's really it's kind of, it's homeschooling as the family it's where where skill is learned and character is built for everybody you know it's it's parents taking classes at junior college it's parents learning um an instrument alongside their children and it's these things that Maria and I have done naturally with our with our own children and we're realizing that um how important it was because, you know, Maria has children now in her thirties. I have teenagers and I'm seeing that that time that I put in with them to do those things that we're doing, it, it's like, I don't want to say money in the bank, but it, it's, you know, it's that, it's that investment, it's investment. Yeah. that is yeah. coming back to me where my teenagers, that we have a lovely relationship, you know, and it's like, it's obvious that you are saying that you're living multi-generational as well, that like your parents put that into you, you know, and yeah. so it's really important. And so we've come up with five areas that we think um, are important for families to know. And I'm just going to name off those five areas. And then Maria and I will kind of, you know, we can have a discussion about them. But the first one is creating the space and the, and the place, kind of, you know, creating that gathering um, place to have these conversations. The second one is being that guardian of childhood, recognizing the age appropriateness of things that you're bringing in, you know, slowing down. The third one is one of my favorites, but it's the outdoor education, it's the adventure, mm -hmm. it's the risky behavior that really kind of cultivates that courage, that bravery. You know, how can children learn these things um, on their own, fail and fail again better, right? Ooh, um, mm -hmm. The fourth one is one of, is also something where Maria and I have bonded, but it's the high quality literature. When I think back of homeschooling my children, it really is the literature is like top, top five. <laughs> um, and the last one is um, similar to kind of the bravery, the, the uh, courage cultivation, but it's the rites of passage, the celebrations. How do we celebrate these milestones to make each year special for our children? Oh, wow. I love this so much. So, so you said that it's not necessarily like we homeschool our kids, but any family could implement these five into their homes and families, even if they don't homeschool. Exactly. And that's the beauty of this family schooling. That's where we like, this could be, you know, like, just like, let's save family. Let's, let's bring in a strong family culture. And I know that's what you, you talk about as well is like, how do we cultivate this? Because this yeah. is a message that we need to, we need to get louder and we need to share to, to say that, you know, to support family, to support parents that I think, I think parents, I mean, we've heard it being a mom now is a lot harder than our moms were and in, in, uh, for me, for my parents in the 70s, mm -hmm. just because there's so much more coming at us, right? Yeah. You know, there's so yeah. much more. All those things that are like tearing apart or attacking our identities or <laughs> pulling yeah. us in different directions and those kinds of things, like it's so true. And, and even more so with our kids, that especially if they're looking at devices and social media, like their attention and their identities are being just bombarded with messages and, and uh, things that are conflicting and scary and families. I love this idea because a family is the unit 
that's going to strengthen our society, right? Like, yeah. and we need our children to come together and our parents come together and together cultivate these things so that, it, I mean, that's really what creates resilience in our children is the, that the family is resilient. So I love that a lot, a lot. So we did talk about the, we did talk a little bit about space and place when we mm -hmm. mentioned that parents don't need to be the facilitator of every minute of every day, right? <laughs> so that's a good start. Anything else you would add to that, that one? So when we talk about space and place, you know, when I was growing up, it was, you know, place was outdoors for kids. You know, mm -hmm. we just would go out and play. And nowadays it can mean so many different things. And so Sheila and I have just recorded an episode about that in terms of, you know, helping people think about, you know, is it a special place in your house that is the gathering place, the living room, the kitchen table? Mm, yeah. right? Is it the fire pit? Is it the, the family trip that we take every year? Is it, you know, when we're in the car, certain things that we do? And so, you know, the, the, the place can be a lot of different things, but it's just deepening that intentionality about it. And so, and then creating, um, the time, because especially mm -hmm. as our kids get older, a lot of times we just have to have that time for them to open up and be sharing their experiences and their thoughts. Wow. So it's basically creating a space where they feel seen and heard and, and can connect with you as parents. And, Absolutely. And feel that freedom to just be. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. 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 So, and then you talked about being a guardian of childhood and things that are age appropriate. So when you have that space and that place and you want to guard, be the guardian of their childhood, what exactly does that look like? Sheila, did you want to answer that? Oh, Maria does. Okay, go ahead, Maria. <laughs> okay, so, so guardian of childhood really came up one time in our conversation. Sheila and I were talking and I, I used that phrase. And what it means is protecting childhood. And that doesn't mean protecting our children. It means protecting childhood and letting them have a childhood. And now I think people are so um, concerned about, you know, making sure their kids are getting a good education and that they're going to get into the right college and all of that, instead of really looking at what children need is play. You know, play is, is, is especially for young children, that's where they are going to learn and that's where they're going to deepen their own sense of self and their creativity and their imagination. And so really protecting that. And that means being screen free. It means, mm -hmm. it means having that family time. It means slowing down. It means, you know, that we don't have to sign them up for every single thing when they're very young. And so for, for me, it means facilitating that space. And, and just for us, a lot of times, you know, when we were homeschooling, we had a very slow pace and we just did things more thematically. But as the kids got older, it meant not signing them up for every activity and not doing the summer camps and just creating family time. And so wow. I'm, I'm, you know, both Sheila and I are real advocates for, for just protecting childhood because childhood is such a precious time. I love that so much. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Sheila? Okay, so this is, did, oh, sorry, it looked like you're not. <laughs> no, no, but it, it's, it's hard. It's Go hard ahead. with three of us here. Um, just that point of not being in a rush to grow up. Yeah. You know, not being in the rush to get, I mean, I, there's, I saw something of like a parent of a one and a half year old looking for soccer camp. And I was just like, no, you just no. throw the ball. But, but that's what parents are. I mean, and, 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 and there's no judgment. However, I just want, yeah. I want to say gently to this parent of play with your child. And I think people, we don't know how to play because play is not something that is valued in our culture when yet it is the best way to communicate with children. So we yeah. need to learn how to play with each other so that we can play with our children. Wow. And, and it's so foundational. I mean, the, so right now when, when, you know, we have children who, who growing up into adulthood, who are lacking these foundational like soft skills and, and it's like this counterproductive, uh, counterintuitive. Now we're thinking, oh, well, maybe we have to teach those soft skills. Maybe we need to introduce those things into them, into their education, into their schooling by, I don't even know, like doing group activities or doing, you know, it, but it's more facilitation and organization of trying to correct the things that they missed from that they would have gotten naturally just from embracing childhood and being a kid and playing. Go ahead, go ahead, Maria. 
So as a teacher, what I started seeing even, you know, three decades ago was like I was having to teach children how to skip, how to hop, how to jump rope. And I mean, these are just things that if children are left to their own devices, they just learn these, they teach each other. And when I started seeing that, I was like, wait a minute, what is happening here? And then of course, play as the foundation for those social skills. And so, you know, we, we have several podcast episodes on the importance of play and outdoor education. And, and we've got some interviews with some sort of play specialists. And so this whole concept of how foundational play is. And when we take that away by having our kids in cars more and in, in activities more and in, indoors more, we're prohibiting the healthy physical and emotional and social development that really happens in childhood. And it happens naturally, you know, mm -hmm. that we don't have to uh, create or facilitate or organize this thing that's going to make them develop those skills. It's just something that naturally happens because they're kids. That's what kids do. And that's what kids want to do. So I love this so much. Age appropriate. And I, I think I could go off on another tangent about that, but I'll, I'll stop right there because I, I just know, like, just let them be kids with our media that that's um, creating too much controversial garbage for our children, okay, and um, making kids grow up too quickly in the media is another thing that just drives me nuts. But that could be a whole different podcast episode, I think. <laughs> But so now I want to go into the, the next one. The next one you said was outdoor. And the cool thing about adventure and outdoor is you mentioned that it, it encourages courage and the ability to, to face failure. That is so awesome. Like so much of our, of our culture right now, it's like, oh no, you know, I read the whole book on mindset about fixed versus growth, you know, that it's like, people are beginning to realize, oh no, our overemphasis of success and our overemphasis of praise has raised children who are afraid of failure. They're afraid to do hard things. They're afraid to try new things. And so, but what you're saying here is that this adventurous side of childhood, we need to help them to cultivate that so that they can embrace challenges and cultivate courage and allow failure to be an opportunity to, to learn instead of a shameful acti activity. So what can we do to, to encourage that aspect of the, of family schooling? I love how you brought that all together. That was really, really nice. Um, and the, the point of this is, is that we want our children to have a, a relationship with the natural world, you know, like when they are babies. We, we want to be outside. We want the fresh air. We want them to have nature be a place for them to be themselves. And yeah. so I can think of no way better. So you have that, you know, and then you have this, just the magnitude of nature. And sometimes when you go against that, you're not going to win, <laughs> you know, no, but it's, but it's natural. It's a soft landing in a sense, you know, I mean, you hope you're going to get you, scrapes and bruises and all those kinds of things while you're outside. Yeah. Before. And it's just like nature creates its natural boundary for you to test. And so both my husband and I like how we met was we met on a backpacking trip and we were river guides and we, so it's part of our family culture. When we talk about, you know, what's, what's your family culture? We are, we have raised our children camping, backpacking, river rafting, rock climbing, all those sorts of things. And so what I have seen is them coming up against failure, coming up against, you know, um, whether it's climbing or, or um, falling out of the raft or, or, you know, kind of going to the edge there and yet coming out on the other side and going, oh, I made it. I did it. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. Right. And so what a, what a way to, to say, you know, that look at what you did here. Now you can do that here too. So you can see that you are strong, that you are capable, you are able, that you've come across this. Now let's carry that to other parts of our lives. And so I just think being part of the natural world, not the rhythms, every season, seasonal rhythms, you know, that's just a piece of cultivating kind of a strength in yourself, an inner strength, mm -hmm. a solace in yourself, and then um, having, again, and then having fun, playing, yeah. right? Yeah. Playing in nature is, is a part of it as well. That's so awesome. 
I love that. And th that's so, you know, these, this ability to endure those kinds of things is really, again, with this soft skill, these ideas of being able to endure, be resilient, to have grit, you know, those kinds of things, yeah. those are going to be cultivated by doing those hard things that are safe, hard things. You know, we don't want relatively safe, hard things, right? We yeah, no, exactly. Want them to do. <laughs> You want to make sure your children know how to swim. You know what I mean? Before you take them river rafting, like you, you have to have the, know that those hard skills as well. Um, another thing that both Maria and I, where we bonded was um, both of our children have um, been exchange students. You know, both of my kids were 13 years old and went to live abroad and my son Spain for six months and my daughter in France for three months, you know, and I do believe that that was because the homeschooling piece would gave them a strong sense of the self that they were able to live abroad. They both came back bilingual, but yet I was an exchange student. I told them it's the toughest thing you will ever do. But, in, but when you come back, you're going to realize that it was also one of the best things. And they both said the same exact thing, like really, really hard. Well, my, my daughter more so than my son, but amazing that they, the gift that they've gotten after. Wow. To experience that challenge. And, and I love something that I've been telling my, my kids a lot lately is you have to be willing to be bad at something first before you can get good at it. And that's how it is with nature or doing something difficult or scary or challenging like that. It's like, at first, you're not going to know the language. You're not going to know how to communicate. You're going to be scared. It's going to be hard. But then at the end of it, you, if you've pushed through that, it's going to be so much better. It's so rewarding. Exactly. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome. Awesome. Okay. So then the next one is classic literature. I'm excited about this one too. Uh, last weekend, actually two weeks in a row, uh, because it's a long series, uh, I watched Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> you know what I was going to say, didn't you? <laughs> I, I actually thought you were going to say Anne with an E. because Oh, uh, oh no, my parents have been into that. They love oh, that God. series. <laughs> so romantical and tragical. I loved it. <laughs> so those are, those are the TV programs, but <laughs> as we're talking about liter media, um, <laughs> go ahead, Maria. <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, when when our children were young, well, when I was young, I read through you know just so much amazing classic literature, and and I had an aunt who was a third grade teacher, and she would always give me you know really wonderful books to read, and so I grew up with that. And then with my own children, we read together. They were both you know the 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 second and third were both well, all of the kids were slightly late readers, and um so family reading was a huge part of our um, child of the family life, and so the classic literature really. The reason it's class, it's withstood the test of time. And so I'm also a big believer in reading the books first because Absolutely. there's nothing like creating the own imagination. And, you know, there's so many children's books that have been made into videos and it's like, oh no, just leave the book alone, you know. Yeah. It, you know but um, but the, the, the stories are archetypal and they resonate with children. And what we've seen is with, you know, decades of children and from diverse backgrounds that these classic pieces have withstood the test of time because of the, the captivating stories, because of the lessons that they teach. And so quite often when something would be going on in our family, if the kids would be squabbling or there were little character traits that were coming up that we weren't thrilled about, I would think, okay, what book do we need to read again? And so, we, you know, we'd pull out and Anne of Green Gables was one of our all-time favorites, you know, just the, the stories. Oh, Pollyanna, yeah. <laughs> uh, little Men, Little Men for Children. I mean, I love Little Women for slightly older, you know, the teen years, but Little Men for Young Children, a beautiful book. And so, you know, we have our list of our top 25 that, you know, we, we recommend, but that there's a reason that we read these together as a family and not just for the kids to be reading them by themselves. There's something to be said for when we read them as a family, then the kids know that we know that they know you know, these, yeah. these yeah. sort of lessons, You're on the same that page. The has, right. And, and also the adventures that we take and it's just so valuable. And so that's a huge part of family school. And I once was talking to this dad who said, well, you know, I'm not a really good reader. I didn't read to, you know, I wasn't read to when I was growing up. I don't. And I said, well, there's no reason to deprive your kids. And so, you know, he started reading with his children. And of course, the more he read, you know, reads to his own children, the better his reading gets and, and the enjoyment of these stories that they might not have gotten as children. So yeah, I just love family reading. That's awesome. That's, I mean, this is something that I, a trend that I've noticed over like pretty much anybody that talks about homeschooling and education for our children encourages classics 
because of that re reason that they are, they stand the test of time and they, you learn those principles, those skills, those, those ideas, you hear their stories of resilience. And I mean, most of these stories have a good solid hero's journey in them that you can see they're, they're cultivating their characters and things like that. And, and, and just sometimes I think some of like mm, children's literature these days doesn't necessarily reflect on those things as well. And there's other issues too with them because a lot of times, like my kids listen to a series every once in a while that they kind of enjoy, but it's more just because it's more accessible. <laughs> and in this series, they lie to their parents all the time because they have this secret or they, you know, or their parents aren't even involved. And it's just like, ah, those are not the kinds of things so much you're going to find in classics. And if you do, you, then there's, you quickly understand the consequence. For there's it. always a consequence. Right. And so yeah. I think that, you know, and, and there is some good contemporary literature and we have, you know, we've found some nice pieces, but in general, the older pieces yeah. really, have much more depth to them. And also the vocabulary is much more rich. And yeah. so that's a piece that we've really seen a change over the decades. Yeah, that's stuff that we really should be preserving anyway. I mean, it, this is really about the language, preserving the language, preserving the stories, preserving the characteristics that a lot of these people and these stories demonstrate, I think is so important, it's so amazing. And I was gonna say too that if, like for that dad that doesn't feel like he's a strong reader, there are amazing audiobook resources. Like I actually volunteered once for LibriVox. He could read on LibriVox and those are all classics. Those are all in the public domain. And so like, it's really cool that you can tap into those kinds of resources for free that classic audiobooks and a lot of them, you know, they're fun to listen to, especially if you can find really good narrator in the LibriVox. Um, like we, we listened to, um, Treasure Island and there's a really great narrator in Treasure Island that the kids really love to listen to. And, and, and so it's really cool. There is access. You can get access to these books, even if it's difficult for you to read these classics. And then me, I, as a parent, I'm gaining from being able to listen as well. And it's fun. It's something that we can do. We just listen to when we're driving or, you know, and that's something that if you do have to be in the car a lot, you can keep these things available, keep them playing, and it becomes something that the kids look forward to doing. So that's really fun for our family. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're going to go somewhere. Let's try on a book. <laughs> yeah. And I want to add that um, sometimes the criticism of classical literature is some of the ideas are antiquated, you know? And so I remember re reading Tom Sawyer with my children and really having to talk about the situation in the South, you know, I mean, like talking yeah. about slavery. So it, it's an opportunity to approach it with curiosity and an opportunity to say how things have changed and, you know, and really try to get different, different viewpoints. So it becomes um, like, you know, so often it became a history lesson as well. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point because a lot of times these classics, they do become multi purpose where you can get the education discussion about facts as well. So that's awesome. All right. So finally, we want to talk about this celebration aspect of, of your family schooling. So what does that look like, Maria? <laughs> so I love bringing celebration into our family life. Uh, we talk about finding joy in the journey. And so in our family, um, birthdays, holidays, celebrations of all kinds. You know, sometimes we would create spontaneous celebrations. And so we feel it's really important to mark the year that way. And then the mm -hmm. years, the passage of time, birthdays, holidays, all of that. But then also this concept of rites of passage as uh, sort of portals for growth. And so I had taken a workshop when my children were very young about rites of passage. And the presenter was talking about why they're so important. And a man stood up and he said, well, I never had anything like this. Why, how could I create something for, for my family when, when I didn't have this? And the presenter said, well, you can create it together, you know, and, and you don't want to deprive your children of these opportunities. And so there were components to the rite of passage. And so there's always sort of like this, you know, you look at different pivotal times. So like going from little kid to big kid, or, you know, obviously adolescence is a pivotal time and then kind of that young adulthood. And so we did different rites of passage for our family, but this idea that there's sort of a, a something that they have to overcome, there's a letting go, there's mm -hmm. a, 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 an acknowledgement and a celebration. And then kind of this, you know, the, the grand 
honoring with family and friends type of a thing. And so these different aspects of rites of passage. So there's a lot around those. But how important it is because then kids really step into this ownership of, yes, mm. now I am. And I can let go of some things and I can move into this new space. And then also bringing just joy and celebration and that marking of time. So we just feel that this is a huge part of family life. And there's so many fun examples that, that we can share over, you know, our experience and the families that we've worked with. But there's also lots of great information out there about how to, to bring this passing of time into our family life. So basically what I hear you saying is that like when they reach a certain milestone in their lives, doing something that gives them that opportunity to say, okay, now I'm not a little kid anymore. I'm a bigger kid or uh -huh. something like that. Or, you know, so what are some of the things that you have done to indicate or to allow, give a child that indication so that they can say, like, for example, I don't know, what's, What's, what's a teenage or a adolescent milestone that you would celebrate? So um, for my daughter, you know, when she hit womanhood, there was, there was a, a kind of a built in our community celebration for her, but for the, the little kid to big kid, I want to go there because that's, that's okay. one that is less common. You know, I mean, of course, different cultures have different things. The bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, that's a very typical one. Yeah. Um, you know, a young woman coming into her menses, you know, there's ways that we can celebrate that. But from the little kid to big kid, um, uh, for my um, my daughter, when she was around eight, and she was really obviously kind of wanting to head into this new zone, so we created this thing where she learned to rock climb. So we went rock climbing. So she gained a new skill, and then she had to kind of achieve something. So it was a learning. It was an achieving. And then there was a casting off ceremony where she kind of let go of some of the things from little kingdom, and then we had a ceremony, the neighbor had a, this lovely gathering space. And so, you know, some family and friends came together and there was an acknowledgement of her and then a celebration, a, a party. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it can create, it can look different for different families, but she really, I could see grew through that experience because she had to kind of, you know, she had to practice something, she had to overcome some, maybe some fears. Mm -hmm. And then she, she worked through that and then, you know, it's like that piece that we were talking about risk too. Yeah. You know? And my son had to do like a moonlit walk in the dark that, you know, by himself from here to there. And, and so the, it was just fun marking of that. And then when they were older, you know, kind of that young adulthood, we sent them both on uh, Knowles trips, the national outdoor leadership school trips. And those oh, were wow. huge rites of passage for them. They both did trips in the Rocky mountains. One was rock climbing and one was horse packing. And so, you know, that was a, a huge rite of passage for them. Wow. But we're also talking about the celebrations, the yearly celebrations, mm -hmm. the birthdays, the holidays, all those kinds of things. And how do you, as a family, mark those? And how do you celebrate those? And then the kids look forward to those things. And so it's a, it's a real joyful activity as well as something that then becomes a part of their life and your family culture. Yeah, because those types of things are things that they look forward to doing with their family. It becomes a tr traditions that they look forward to and sharing those experiences together really binds your family together. So I love that. That's awesome. So I love these five pillars of family schooling. And this is, I can definitely see, you know, this is such a powerful resource for, you know, I love that you've de defined these five things so that it strengthens our families, strengthens children, allows all of us all of us, not just the kids, to cultivate these soft skills and these, you know, abilities to, to grow and to, you know, allow for the fact that life is going to have obstacles, going to have imperfections, and that that's okay. <laughs> and that that's actually something we should celebrate and honor and learn how to grow from, right? So all of those things. So awesome. You guys, okay. So where can we find you and where can we get more information about all these things and, and your and the uh, Moms I Know podcast? So where what's a URL or a, your social link that we can find you? Okay, the best place to find us is at themomsiknow.com. Uh, the website, it's for our podcast, but then you can also find me personally on that website, Sheila Walsh, um, as a homeschool coach and, and nutrition consultant. And then you can also find Maria Farner there uh, for the future of family, who is going into uh, being the expert on multi-generational living, as well as um, guardian of childhood. Cool. 
I think that uh, Maria, we should have you on again to talk about that multi-generational living sometime. We could talk about it for a while, I think. <laughs> I, I would but, love that. It sounds like similar awesome. family paths. So. Uh -huh. Very cool. So awesome. I loved having you both here on the show and talking about this amazing, you know, I am just love the resources and the ideas of how we can strengthen our family culture so just thank you so much thank you for your work and the, the things that you're creating so that more of us can have these resources and examples of how we can strengthen our family culture so thank you so much well thanks thank you, for having us it was fun